the wax moths. This used to be the worst problem beekeepers ever had to deal with. Those must have been the days, right? They actually can be a lot, a lot of problems for us now, but uh, there's two different kinds. There's the greater wax moth, which isn't so great, and the lesser wax moth, but that just refers to their size. But I'm gonna really just talk about the greater wax moth because you deal with them both pretty much the same way. You also hear them called wax worms because the caterpillar is, the, again, it's the larval stage that does all the damage. And they will do damage. These suckers can destroy combs and they can even chew up the woodwork. So these again are opportunists. They get into beehives that are weak and they're a real big problem on stored comb. So when you harvest your honey and, and you take the, those combs off and you leave them off of the beehives, there's no bees protecting them. Or if you have a dead out, that's a colony that died. So you've got empty combs, especially brood combs. These things fly around looking for them and they love uh, to find them. They actually sell these things in pet stores. They, they sell them for you to feed to your exotic reptiles and lizards. They also sell them at the bait shop. They make great trout bait. But if the fish aren't biting, don't just dump them out in the backyard like you would a can of worms because they'll crawl right over to your beehives. But they can just destroy your combs in no time at all. They tunnel right through it. They leave this webbing. If you're using plastic foundation, they'll eat right down to the plastic and then they'll leave little tiny tooth marks in the plastic. If you are using wax foundation, they'll eat everything but the wires. And as they go along, they, they just make this humongous mess. Uh, don't confuse them with the small hive beetle larvae. These are about twice as big. These will be about an inch, maybe a little bit bigger. And these get up to half an inch long at the most, right before they, they escape. But you will find them both in the same colonies because they both go after colonies that are, are in poor health. Uh, these have this row of spines along their back. I mean, they're tiny, you gotta look at them close. And they've got really well-developed legs and this long abdomen. These guys do have legs up front, uh, but they've also got a, another set of legs back here in the back called prolegs. And they look like they're wearing a bicycle helmet. They've got this little, it's called a head capsule, little uh, dark reddish brown uh, head capsule on there. But they're all bad news. But they tunnel through the comb, as I said. When they start out small, they're usually under the surface. And sometimes uh, your bees will even uncap cells looking for them, and that leads to a condition that uh, beekeepers sometimes call bald brood. If you see uncapped cells in a straight line, we think that that's the bees chasing a larva that's going from, from one cell to the next, and, and they, they uncap it trying to find it. And if they do, they grab it, they kill it, they get rid of it. So a strong colony can manage these on their own, but a weaker colony, uh, they start to get out of hand. Wax moths are always flying around looking for bee colonies, and they're always trying to sneak in. Bees will repel them, they'll kill them and get rid of them, but if they get in and they start laying eggs, then it can be uh, quite a problem. But the caterpillars are eating machines. They're hungry little caterpillars that eat pollen, they love cocoons. They like the protein, the silk cocoons where the bees are pupating. So they love dark brood combs and they will actually eat the beeswax. If they can't find anything else, they'll even eat plain beeswax. But usually your uh, combs that have only had honey in them are not nearly as susceptible as brood combs. But once you've had a cycle of brood in that comb, they find it irresistible. They spin this webbing as they tunnel through and eat, and we think that that is uh, kind of just to protect them. It gives them something to hide behind. But you'll see a little bit or you'll see a whole lot if there's a, a whole lot of them there. And they leave frass, that's the scientific word for bug poop, but they leave uh, frass all over the place. And they chew up the wood, you wouldn't believe it, but they can, when they reach their full size, they gouge out uh, a little, little area there and knit a sleeping bag around them and spin a cocoon and pupate, emerge as a, a wall, uh, an adult moth and do it all again. So you sometimes see the insides of your boxes with these, these gouges in them we call galleries. If they get on frames sometimes they'll just turn them into Swiss cheese and 
frames aren't that thick anyway, so sometimes they'll, they'll just chew right through them. Well, what do you do about these suckers besides prey? Well, a mild infestation is usually manageable. Uh, if there's just a little bit of, of light webbing in there, uh, take them out and put them in the freezer. Your spouse loves opening up to uh, thaw out something for dinner and finding all of your, your bee equipment in there. But if you've got a big chest freezer or something, you can put the whole hive in there. Freeze them for 72 hours at least. Insects can withstand extreme cold for short durations, so uh, it takes about three to four days sometimes to kill them. But take them out, stack that box back on top of a strong colony, and those bees will come up and they'll actually clean all that up if it's, it's just a little bit of a mess. You can take your bee brush and, and you can brush off anything loose, any frass, any, any webbing on the surface. But if, if it's not terribly damaged, then this colony will just rebuild it all and, and they'll reuse it. But you don't want to just drop it. If you find them in this hive, don't just drop it on here and put a bunch of live insects in there, a bunch of live caterpillars. So freeze it first. For a severe infestation, you might just want to retire. It's going to make you want to feel that way. It's a, that's a bad feeling. Your bees learn some four-letter words. But again, freeze them. Freeze the whole thing. Wrap it up in a, in a garbage sack, put it in the freezer, and that's because otherwise you're going to have all this nasty stuff that just falls out of it. But then you're just going to have to scrape everything clean and put new foundation into your frames. Once it's to that point, there's not a whole lot else you can do. If you're using plastic foundation, you can scrape it all down to the bare plastic. And some people take a power washer and just blast them. Uh, the best time to clean them is straight out of the freezer. Take that whole box of frozen wax and drop it. It'll just shatter. And then you can scrape off all the rest of the debris. But if it's warm, it's, it can be a big gooey mess, especially if there's a lot of dead caterpillars in it. Uh, but don't, uh, don't just drop uh, wax moths all over the, the ground because they'll crawl around. Anybody have fire ants? Don't you love fire ants? When you get wax moths, when you discover a box that's full of wax moths, go over there to a fire ant mound, away from your beehives, give it a kick, and drop that box right on top of the fire ant mound. <laughs> they'll swarm up and they'll eat all the honey, but they'll kill and consume all of those wax moths. But they won't destroy the honeycombs the way the wax moths do. They might lick the honey out of it, but they won't, they won't destroy the comb and they won't mess up the wood. So fire ants are good for something. Now, you gotta go back later and pick that box up covered in fire ants, right? Now, when, uh, when they have consumed everything, they're not gonna be all over it necessarily, but so do be careful. Pick it up real quickly, take it somewhere far away, and let all the ants crawl off of it again. But if you do have fire ants, they can be useful, and you can torture some uh, wax moth larvae in the process. Strong colonies, again, are your best defense against these guys. Uh, if that box is full of bees, the wax moths will not get in. If they do, they're gonna, gonna be dealt with and dispatched pretty quickly. So don't over super. You can stack all these boxes up because you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna go on spring break vacation. I won't have time to super my hives. Well, if there's only bees in the bottom half and the top is just empty, especially if those are older combs and you've ever had a queen up there that laid brood in your honey supers, those are delicious. So one little crack or crevice so you don't have the lid on tight, that lets a moth in where bees are not patrolling. And stay queen right so your population is strong. Where do you store your combs? Well, the safest place, if you've got a big freezer, store them frozen. Of course, if you've got a big operation, a lot of hives, you're not gonna have enough freezers for all of that unless you're planning to build a giant walk-in or something, but most people don't. But that is the safest place to store all of your comb. Again, when you're taking them out, you look at it wrong and sneeze, it will shatter like fine crystal. So be very careful moving frozen combs. A lot of people will put them into plastic bags and just freeze the whole entire box. And if you wanna do that just to kill anything, that's great. When you take it out though, if you're not storing it in the freezer, make sure you take it out of the plastic because if you trap a bunch of humidity inside those boxes 
if there's any pollen or anything on there, you, they'll start to look like this. They will grow mold on all over them in no time at all. So you don't want to store them in plastic at, at room temperature. A great way to store unused combs, drawn combs, is where they get lots of light and air circulation. This is more popular in northern climates where they have a long cold season. As soon as you get a good frost, then uh, you know the, the moths aren't going to be out and these are usually safe to store like this. But you know it seems like anymore we have 70 degree days in winter. It used to be once October or so came along you didn't have to worry about it. But now you start to see insects out you know at Christmas time. So there's, there's no real guarantees about uh, the cold weather keeping them at bay. Uh, there is a product called BT. Some of y'all may know what that is. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria that produces this protein crystal that is toxic only to caterpillars. There's other varieties that are toxic to beetles, some that work only on flies, but this one variety only works on caterpillars. And it's used in a lot of organic farming, and they've actually engineered different crops to produce this protein as well so that it, it keeps the, the crops safe from from different caterpillar pests, but um, this we used to be able to buy this and then it was taken off the market. It lost its certification for bees, but now uh, just recently it's back on. So you can purchase this stuff. You mix it with water and you spray it right on the comb and let it dry. And if a caterpillar takes a bite, they die. So it's completely organic. It's harmless to bees. It won't affect your honey or anything else. The only thing it affects are caterpillars. It's a little bit labor intensive if you've got a lot of combs to go through. You've got to spray this on every single one. But uh, it, it is an option if, if you don't have a lot of space to, to store things, and, and especially if you want to remain organic. So that's something to look for. And make sure that you indeed do read and follow all directions. Uh, you can fumigate your equipment. This is what big commercial beekeepers do. They'll have a whole warehouse full of hives stacked up like this and, and they may use products that you can't even buy without a, a special license. So we won't talk about those, but on a smaller scale, you can do it yourself at home. Uh, I recommend uh, taping them with masking tape or painter's tape, not duct tape, which is gonna leave a sticky residue on all the edges of your, your boxes. But uh, you just wanna seal them up and probably stack up five or six. I wouldn't go too tall. And uh, then you can use uh, moth crystals and make sure that you're paying attention to the product you're buying. Uh, if you're ordering from a bee catalog, you get Paramoth. It's paradichlorobenzene, or PDB. That is the chemical. Never, ever, ever, ever use naphthalene, which is what is in old mothballs. Uh, they do make stuff called moth crystals, uh, which is, is PDB, but it, make sure that you're not using naphthalene. That's extremely toxic to your bees and to you. Never ever put that on your beekeeping equipment. This stuff, it is carcinogenic, but supposedly it evaporates completely, so I'm not sure how I feel about that, but, you know. The idea is that uh, you can put these crystals uh, on top of a stack and then you just put your lid back on and they evaporate. The vapors are heavier than air and they just kind of settle down and every couple of weeks just peek in the lid, make sure there's still some crystals there. If there's not, you sprinkle a few more, then you close them up again. But if, uh, if there's some there, then you don't need to worry about it. These people made little pouches out of paper. So you can do that and, and that will keep your your equipment safe uh, from the wax moths. It'll kill any phases that are in there and also the odor will repel uh, the moths. Do this in a well ventilated area. So outside, maybe a, in your barn, in a three-sided shed, but not in your garage where you're gonna keep the door closed and there's gonna be people walking around because you do not wanna be breathing these, these odors. You can also use acetic acid. This is glacial acetic acid. It's 80% pure. Uh, you have to get this from a chemical supply house. Acetic acid is vinegar, but this is not the kitchen vinegar that, that you would have in, in your kitchen. That's like 1%. Uh, if you ever did darkroom photography, this was stop bath. So 
uh, you, you can get it, and you use it the same way. You just put a little dish in the top of a stack of supers, and it evaporates, and the vapors will, will take care of that, and you refill it as needed. Again, put it in a very well-ventilated place. Uh, this stuff is corrosive, so over time, the little nails and metal parts on your frames may start to corrode, but that'll, that'll take quite a few seasons to, to really see that.